Bond story is brought to you in part by the Alice Clayburgh Reynolds Foundation, a Texas family providing innovative funding since 1979. Story, presented by Austin Film Festival, a look inside the creative process from today's leading writers and directors. This week's On Story, filmmaking legends Jonathan Demme and Paul Thomas Anderson. I need a theme, um, as pretentious as that sounds. No. Um, I, I, I need, in order to make a good movie, I need a strong story, but I also have to know what it's about beyond the narrative. In this episode, Paul Thomas Anderson and Jonathan Demme look back on the vision, style, influences, and creative passion behind Demme's The Silence of the Lambs, Stop Making Sense, Rachel Getting Married, and Something Wild. I kind of fell backwards into filmmaking. I, I, we did a, a little panel earlier, and I explained how like, I was a, did some movie reviews and wound up getting a publicity job and having Roger Corman read my publicity stuff and wanted me to write a script and then giving me the opportunity to produce that script. And then when I got intrigued with directing, he let me direct and stuff. And so for me, it was just like I was doing this directing thing. First, I did three, I guess I, did, I directed three pictures with Corman. And I was just so both thrilled to be doing this. You know, I adored movies from the, from the first time I saw TV when I was like, you know, three when it was invented, you know, I was just like, oh my God, you know, and so I was just so thrilled to be doing it. I was also terrified because I didn't know what the hell I was doing, really. Luckily, I teamed up with Tak Fujimoto early on and he did know what he was doing, but I didn't know what a director was supposed to do. And then, and then over time, uh, and I kept getting opportunities, and I, I, I always, I loved every script that I was uh, offered the opportunity to do. And um, I wasn't interested in, in uh, I was just interested in making another movie. Mm -hmm. And I, I recognized the need to be enthusiastic about the script that you do. Um, because unless we do something that we really feel passionate about, and that can be a comedy like Married to the Mob, or it can be something that's the most important thing in your life, like making a movie about AIDS discrimination. You've got to have that, that enthusiasm in order to do good work, for me anyway. What I love about my filmography is that I, uh, that I do fiction films and also uh, documentaries and also performance films and also television. So I think that's like really, I like that, that, I like that kind of, and I finally, after years of deciding, you know, I, I, I know I'm a good director, and mm -hmm. I'm trying to get better and better every, everything I do every time out. So um, uh, I'm glad I haven't repeated myself, and I think if, if, if that's part of what keeps me going. There's certain kind of shots that you'll do, and perspectives that you'll go to, and times you'll choose to move the camera that are just like only yours. And um, my visual style was I had aspirations to, for the kind of the classical Hollywood style. Um, I wanted to, my, my movies to have, you know, dolly shots and things like, look like movies by Raoul Walsh or, mm -hmm. you know, the directors that I really loved, those Hollywood directors. So Tack and I, the, 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 as our budgets got bigger, moving away from Corman, you know, we, he, he could get some more equipment and what have you. And, and so our style was evolving. And, and then we fell into the, this kind of exploration of subjective camera, um, which worked so nice in little tiny tastes from Hitchcock and from Sam Fuller. So we were like, well, why don't we see how much more you can use that, you know, mm -hmm. pulling the audience into the, into the uh, uh, character's shoes and stuff. But then I started doing documentaries. And then at a certain point, I got, I got a little bit tired of, of the classical thing. You know, our ver my version of classical mm -hmm. it became a little predictable to me. And I knew this would be a good time to dolly in and all that stuff for emphasis. And I was making more and more documentaries, so that's when Declan Quinn and I did um, Rachel Getting Married Together. It was, and I loved those, um, 
there was a dogma films, the, the um, Scandinavian films, so much that just felt so real, you know. So we decided to shoot Rachel Getting Married, um, pretending it was a documentary. We had no pre-planned shots. Even Declan didn't know how he was going to shoot it. I'm just sitting at the monitor seeing what's going to happen next. The actors didn't know what was going to happen. So I made a big stylistic shift there. <laughs> Part of the art, but, uh, I will say that Sydney had a little time to survey things. He did a little planning. You, you don't. You keep working this amazing. So you keep coming up with amazing shots that we've never seen before that that work so expressively there. But I'm, I feel like kind of um, I'm ready to, you know, like like some of the TV stuff lately, I'm like, oh, this one should be more classical. Mm -hmm. Like I just did a pilot that I really enjoyed shooting for AMC called Line of Sight, and that's very classical, a lot of end of the camera, a lot of nicely manipulative cool shots and stuff, and it turned out really good. But um, uh, so I'm, I, I enjoy working in different styles now. Just for a second, talk about subjective camera when you started messing around with that, because I can remember you doing it a little bit in something wild. I remember it really particularly at the end when when uh, Ray Liotta gets stabbed, mm. you know, and they're looking into the camera. <laughs> but when you did Silence of the Lambs, you really took it to, uh, uh, you really kind of grabbed it and it was a very serious part of that movie. I guess my, I have a couple questions is, how does that work when you tell an actor you're going to do this scene. It's not just like a shot, a shot into the lens. It's a long, it's a probably eight to ten page scene into the lens. How did that sit the first time you threw that out there? Yeah. And did you maybe do it another way first and then talk them into looking into the camera? Just talk well, a little bit about that. You know, it's it's and you know in, in Has anybody here not seen Silence of the Lambs, by well, the way? No, no, no. <laughs> but the the thing is that that what 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 Paul's talking about, subjective camera, in case you, you, you're not a, a crazed film buff like, like we are, that's when, when um, you, know, you, you show exactly what the character sees. You shoot it exactly from their point of view. And in doing that, you can also, you, you need a, a compliment, which is them looking right into the lens. And in film grammar, that's going to translate into, that's what they see. And you, you, if it's a dialogue scenes and you want to have the characters talking to each other, you need to have a couple of tight over the shoulders to work your way. You can't just suddenly crash in on those things. You know, this whole idea of like, you want the audience to be in the character's shoes. Mm -hmm. uh, operating on the premise that the more deeply into the character's shoes the audience is, the more they're going to care about what's going on, the more they'll bond with the character. So we started kind of playing around a little bit more because it's, it's scary to have to ask the actors to act to the camera, to the lens. Um, you know, they may think you're insane or something. Um, so, you know, we started experimenting and doing f scenes of two people looking at each other in a couple of places, and um, it worked. It was like, holy shit. you know, it's like Hitchcock does it and Sam Fuller does it, and now I do it too, you know? <laughs> and uh, that, was, that was really cool. And also, you could, you, it felt effective. So when we got to, um, to do Science of the Lambs next, we decided to really commit to um, uh, when, when Jody, uh, when Clarice is together with Dr. Lecter, we're going to have our, because the actors get used to the scene and the looser shots, and then they get more and more on it the tighter in you get. So by the time we get to the close-ups, which are going to be into the lens, they're really cooking now. Now then, tell me, what did Miggs say to you? Multiple Miggs in the next cell. He hissed at you. What did he say? He said, I can smell your I see. I myself cannot. And what's great is that not one review, not one person ever said, oh, that's weird, either, oh, that's weird, they're always looking into the lens, or, wow, that's cool, they're looking at the lens. Nothing. It was invisible to the moviegoers, because that means the story was working for them and the performances were working for them. But um, 
it, it is hard to, to get people to... That's the magic of actors, though, right? I mean, which is that the true, true magic to me of filmmaking are the actors. You know, we can go out and you can dream up your great shots and, and we can all do our thing, but now the camera's rolling. The actors really own it. And um, uh, not only can they create this magic of, of, of creating a reality, they can even do it staring into a camera. It's wild. It's just wild. Jody was just like, she wasn't anything. She was just like this person, this normal person who came up. And she said, listen, um, I know that you're seeing other people. And I know that, um, you know, and I've heard that Michelle Pfeiffer might play it. And I just wanted to have the opportunity to tell you that I love this book so much. And I love this part so much. And the reason I love it is because and, you know, there's all these movies with men, like, you know, going in and saving a bunch of people and doing one thing or another. But this story, Science of the Lambs, it's about one young woman uh, trying to, trying desperately to save the life of another young woman. And in order to do that, she's faced with the, the overwhelming obstacle of all these men. And they may be brilliant. So they may be, in, you know, but everywhere she turns, she's faced with this. And um, she said, and I, I just think that's a great story. And so she left and I went, hmm, that is rather a, a great theme. I think I'm going to take that theme uh, and, and, and claim it, but I'm not going to cast her. Um, and because uh, now I wanted Meg Ryan to play the part. Um, Harry and Sally had just come out, Joe and the Volcano stuff, and I thought, she's great, and I would believe her. I think she's a fabulous actress. I would believe her. I wouldn't believe Jodie Foster in that part. So um, the script goes to Meg Ryan, and uh, word comes back very quickly, like, good God, I could never do a movie like that. She was slightly offended. So, oh, and then Laura Dern came in, and Laura was just it. I knew from the moment Laura came in that she was just Oh my God! And I was like, "Wow!" And she hadn't. Laura had done like some little movies, um, and I told you know the folks at Orion. I said, "You know, this this is the one," and and they were like, "Jonathan, we're really worried about that in the context of Jodie Foster, who won an Oscar, who everybody loves, and she's desperate to do this, and and you want to cast a relative unknown." So they said, please meet Jody one more time. So Jody came back, and I'm, I'm sure that other filmmakers have had moments like this. I'm sure you have, but, but it, the moment came where I met Jody again. I was no, le no more taken with her at all. We chatted, and we said goodbye. And to me, it was saying goodbye forever. Uh, and, and you know, I, I went to the doorway, and I looked, I looked down the hallway. And I saw this young woman putting one foot in front of the other, walking on down the hallway. And I thought about how much she loved that part. And I thought how much my partners at, at uh, Orion wanted her in that part. And I was like, eh, I'll go with her. <laughs> <laughs> and look what happened. I mean, I, I just, you know, I fell madly in love with her. And she did what she did. And uh, she was just, she embodied all that. That, that, that fierce, uh, I, I named our production company Strong Heart Productions after um, Jody's you know, sense of character. Let's talk about, like, Stop Making Sense. Well, that wasn't the first concert film you did, was it? Would yes. It I guess it was. Yeah. Well, first and best <laughs> ever concert film. But then, um, yeah, yeah. Thank you. But how did you... Um, <laughs> You, how, did, how did that happen, and how did that kind of yeah. begin this kind of long, long resume now of, of performance films? Well, that was crazy, because um, Gary Getzman and I went to see The Talking Heads at the Greek Theater in Los Angeles. And what I saw on stage was, I thought, literally a movie waiting to be filmed. There was this kind of this character-driven narrative going on with David with the, the different kind of 
uh, 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 even costume changes and attitude changes. And um, the way it, uh, the show brought the musicians on one at a time and visualized the development of, the, of uh, how that sound uh, expands and develops and deepens. And also, there was also this amazing lighting going on. And I was like, I turned to Gary and said, dude, we should film this. So um, we tracked David's management down and had a meeting with David. David came out and met with Gary and I beside a swimming pool in the Hollywood Hills. And David, David said this thing to me, he's like, um, and how will this concert film be different from all other concert films? <laughs> and I, I feel like such a poser anyway. <laughs> so I was like, oh God. So I was like, gulp. And I said, well, David, it'll be your band and your music, and I'll be directing it, you know? <laughs> and he's like, hmm, you know? <laughs> but they came back. Uh, the heads came back and uh, had, had talked to the folks at Warner's, so they were going to finance it. So we just did it, and um, I reached out to Jordan Cronenweth, who I had had the privilege of working with on Citizen Band back in the 70s, and um, asked Jordy if he'd be interested in doing this. And, and part of the allure for, for David was that, that the lighting that he had, he was so, you know, he, he, the, that was his lighting. He was working with a lighting director, but that was his lighting. Everybody, get in line. Nothing can come between us. Nothing cuts you down. Nothing strikes your fancy. And he was never able to, to, to kind of know that the lighting as seen from the audience at the shows was what he was seeing in his head because there's just a little too much ambient light in a, in, a, in a rock venue. So now, if we made this film, he'd have the opportunity to see the lighting that he had always seen in his mind. I never talked to Jordy about the light. David talked to Jordy about the light. And, um, you know, we, we shot the first night of that, uh, we shot at the P Pantages Theater. And the first night, um, I was like, uh, talk about learning on the job. It was like, okay, you know, uh, we'll, we'll have the light up on the, you know, we're, Jordy, can you do the stage, make that lighting okay, but, but can we have enough light on the audience so we can film the audience? And, and so, you know, we can, yes, and he could thread that needle. And the first night, the concert was horrendous. It was a debacle because the audience had lights on them and cameras pointing at them. And they weren't giving good feedback, mm -hmm. and the band felt that, and it was disastrous. And you know, at the end of that show, it was like, okay, no more light on the audience. Um, and from this moment, this 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 thing I love to do, which is never show the audience, was born. So the moviegoer gets to feel like this is for you. This wasn't for those people you see rocking out or not rocking out in that case. <laughs> So, so that's how that was born. And I also wanted to shoot it like a, like a feature film and not do a bunch of quick cuts, which had become pretty fashionable already mm -hmm. um, on TV and what have you, but um, just rather shoot it with you know, expressive uh, uh, camera, camera work and what have you. And uh, we, Jordy gathered a bunch of fantastic operators, and we went out on a mini tour um, uh, the week before we were going to shoot because I wanted to test certain angles and I wanted to write a script so that it would literally have a script of where, where the camera would be for every, at every moment at every song. I made this movie Citizen's Band mm -hmm. and it turned out good. You know, it was about CB radio and what have you and it opened in like, you know, like I think 1600 theaters and um, I swear to God, nobody came. No one came to see this movie. It got wonderful reviews. It was kind of fresh off the New York Film Festival. It didn't mean jack shit. Nobody showed up. And the opportunities for me dried up immediately. In, I was living in LA then. 
and I couldn't get anything. Um, I couldn't get anything. I couldn't get a talk show, and and I needed money. And um, the DGA has this emergency fund that you, the Directors Guild, that you could go to them and get some money. And I, I went to them and I got some money from them. And uh, I was just like, oh, and I was calling my agents, and they, even they didn't want to take my calls anymore, you know. <laughs> and um, I got a phone call, and it was, um, uh, it doesn't matter which agent it was. He's just like, you've got, you've got an appointment. Um, uh, so and so wants to to see you. He's got something going on over at you know MGM, and he wants to see you. And I was like, what? wow. And he says, what? That's amazing. What happened? He says, well, he, maybe he saw a Citizens Man and whatever. But but be over there at 3 p.m. And this was a producer. His name it came back to me. Um, and I, I'm not sure if he's still making movies. His name, this was a man named Steve Tish. And. I went into his office, and you know what happened, you guys? I swear to God, I go in and I sit down like this. I'm down to my last like 120 bucks of DGA emergency money. I go to sit down, and Steve Tish, who's young, he's my age, and he, he leans across the desk and he goes like, my, the first film I produced is coming out next week. What the hell's it like to have a flop like this? <laughs> and, and so, and I, you know, that's, that's why he wanted to meet with me. And, and, and I, th I think I told him, you know, calmly, but I think I said, you wind up having a moment like this in your life. <laughs> Thank you, sympathy. Thank you so much. Thank you. How'd you get out of jail? I mean, after um, a yeah, well, uh, after Citizens Band, Peter you... Falk right. saw uh, Citizens Band, and he thought it was amazing, mm -hmm. and he had them call me up to see if I'd come direct to Columbo, which I went racing out and had a blast directing Columbo, and and then around the same time, um, there was a regime change at United Artists, and. Um, the men who had been my boss when I was a publicist there became briefly, it turns out, um, the, the heads of production. And they offered me a movie to direct. Uh, and I went and did it, and that was the last embrace, right. which did, didn't turn out very well. We, we went forth with a, without, with a script that wasn't good yet. Um, and we went out too soon because um, these wonderful men, Gabe Sumner, they said, look, you know, we're going to be out of these jobs like so fast. You've got, if you want to do this, you better just do it. Don't, don't, never mind this bullshit about getting the script right. So, so we, we shot it. And then uh, while we were filming that up in, and we were up in Niagara Falls and I got a phone call from, cause so now that you're working again, it's cool. No one's seen how Last Embrace will eventually turn out and hold that against you, all they know is you're working again. Mm -hmm. And you did the Columbo, so uh, it's a forgiving business, as, as we thank God, as we've seen so many times. But then I got a phone call from Tom Mount at Universal who loved Citizens Band and who thought I'd be just right to direct this movie about Melvin Dumar. So I got signed up to do um, Melvin and Howard before finishing Last Embrace. Wow. So that was, but that's, that's a, you know, again, if there's, any, if there's a, a grain of wisdom to be had from any of this, it's like that thing about, you know, really do, do, I was very enthusiastic about Citizens Man. I loved the script, I loved the cast, I had a great time making it. It stiffed, my life became a nightmare, but because I was able to do my best work, Peter Falk noticed that and gave me a job. And Tom Mount noticed that mm -hmm. and gave me a job. And I always tell um, you know, my actor friends, I don't know, if, you know what your philosophy is on this, Paul, but my thing is it's like, like, don't be seeking leading parts, whoever you are and whatever you've done. Be seeking great parts, even if they're only one scene long. Mm -hmm. don't, don't take a mediocre leading role over a great Actually, I've probably used this to persuade people to play small parts in my movies. 
Um, but you know, it's that, that's it, because we are so judged. I guess everybody is in every business, but boy, it's so, you know, it's up on a big screen or a, or a flat screen, a plasma or something like that. So we, we're judged by, by our stuff, you know, and it's, if, you, if you're not doing things that you can do with passion, well, you better watch out, because your, your work's not going to look very good. Right. You've been watching Jonathan Demme and Paul Thomas Anderson on On Story. For more On Story, check out our free podcast at onstory.tv or search the iTunes store. And get the book today, On Story, Screenwriters and Their Craft, on Amazon.